the only thing that makes it part of your life is that you keep thinking about it. And that is the thought for today. Welcome to 7 Good Minutes. I'm Clyde Lee Dennis. Thanks for joining me for what I believe will be seven of the most enriching minutes of your day. In today's episode of 7 Good Minutes, our friends at the School of Life talk with us about how to deal with the fear of breaking up. Enjoy. Let's imagine that we know what we want to leave a relationship, but that we're suffering from a problem which inhibits us from acting on our wishes. We can't bear to cause another person pain, especially another person towards whom we feel a sense of loyalty, who's been kind to us, who looks up to us for their safety and their future, who has expectations of us, and with whom we might have been planning a trip together to another continent in a few months. Perhaps we've come near to telling them on a dozen occasions, but always pulled back at the very last moment. We tell ourselves that we'll get around to it after the holidays, or once their birthday party's over, or next year, or in the morning, and yet the deadlines roll by and we are still here. Our discomfort has to do with the thought of unleashing an appalling upset. They will dissolve into tears. There will be sobbing, which may last a very long time. There will be wailing, uncontrollable cries and mountains of wet tissues, all because of a truth that currently lurks in the quiet recesses of our cranium. We will have been responsible for dragging a formerly competent and independent person into chaos. It's more than we can bear. It sounds peculiar, but it might almost be better for us to spend the next few decades unfulfilled than experience even five minutes of unbounded upset. In another part of our minds, there may also be a terror. More than we realize day to day, we're scared of our partner. By telling them it's over, we risk a discharge of titanic anger. They may scream at us, accuse us of leading them on, of being a charlatan and a disgrace. There might be violence and danger there is a certain symmetry to our fears. We may tell them, and by doing so, kill them. Or we may tell them, and they will turn around and kill us. Kill or be killed. No wonder we put off the news. The reasonable adult part of our minds knows that these fears of killing and dying can't really be true. But this may weigh very little in how we unconsciously feel. Wielding sensible arguments can at points be as effective as telling a person with vertigo that the balcony won't collapse, or a person with depression that there are perfectly good grounds to be cheerful. A lot of our mind is not amenable to hard-headed logic. In an ancestral part of us, we simply operate with a sense that going against the wishes of a significant person will mean either endangering their lives or our own. To explain the origins of such terrors, childhood is the place to turn, as it always is when trying to account for disproportionate and limitless fears. Perhaps we are the offspring of a fragile parent, whom we loved profoundly and whom it would have broken our hearts to disappoint. They might have been struggling with their mental or physical health. They might have been maltreated by another adult. Maybe they were relying on us to hold them back from despair or justify their whole lives we may have derived an early impression that we had to conform to their idea of us if we weren't to cause them grave damage, that our wishes and needs could easily have driven them to the edge, that by being more ourselves, we might have broken their spirit. We simply loved them too much and at the same time felt them to be too weak to ask them to take on our reality. We can be three years old and, without knowing any of this consciously, have taken such messages on board. And as a result, we might then have learnt to play very quietly, to rein in our boisterousness or mischievousness, our aggression or our intelligence, to be extremely cheerful and helpful around the house, to be no trouble at all towards a beloved adult who already seemed to have far too much on their plate. Alternatively, we might have spent our most vulnerable years around a person who responded to any frustration caused by another person with extreme anger. It can be hard to appreciate just how terrifying an enraged adult can seem to a sensitive two-year-old. 
Another adult might know that this red-faced figure of course wasn't going to murder anyone. They're just letting rip for a while and will pick up the pieces of a smashed vase soon enough. But that's not at all how it can seem through a child's eyes. How are they to know that this person many times their size wouldn't just go one step further and at the end of their ranting pick up a hammer and smash their skull in? How can they be certain that the momentarily, genuinely out-of-control parent who just broke the door wouldn't, for that matter, throw them out of the window too? Child murder may be entirely alien to the furious adult, but that's not how it can strike a sensitive offspring. One doesn't have to actually murder anyone to come across, to an unformed mind, as someone who seriously might. No wonder we might be a bit scared of sharing some awkward news. Our minds are freighted with fears that stem from things that happened under precise circumstances long ago, but that continue to have a potent, subterranean, scarcely recognised and immense force in our lives today. By taking stock of the past, the task is to acknowledge that these fears are very real, but only in a very limited space, our own minds. They don't belong to adult reality. Please keep in mind, this is about half of the entire presentation. If you're up for a treat, you should definitely listen to the whole thing. You can do so by clicking the link labeled View the Full Video on YouTube in the show notes. So that does it for this episode of 7 Good Minutes. Until next time, let's be civil to one another out there. Thanks for listening. <laughs>